Francis Galway stands charged with inciting members of the police force to commit breaches of discipline, contrary to Section 53 of the Police Act. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public who are eligible for jury service and whose names appeared on the electoral register. You are Peter Ivan Vaughan of 21, the Dell, Fulchester? Yes. And uh, what is your profession? I'm a member of the police force of this county. Yes, you are in fact his chief constable, are you not? Yes. Yes. His lordship has agreed to take your testimony first, Chief Constable. Thank you, my lord. Chief Constable, are you acquainted with the defendant in this case? Yes. Yes. Will you tell the court how you became acquainted? Well, I happened to meet him in a pub on uh, December the 24th last, by chance. Yes, the uh, Windsor Castle in Meadow Street. Yes, although I knew him vaguely from before. Yes, I see. What happened subsequently? Well, we had a few jar uh, drinks, and then he asked me if I'd be willing to advise him on a series of articles he was planning. Yes, on what subject? A uh, law and order. So we arranged to have a drink after the new year. Where? At my home. Why there? Well, because of what he represented himself to be, a serious journalist. And it was Christmas Eve, after all. Yes, I see. Uh, please continue, Chief Constable. Well, Galway came over on January the 4th, in the early part of the evening. Uh, we didn't stay there long, because he insisted on buying me dinner at the Falconry Restaurant instead, uh, which was the first sign I realised afterwards. And what do you mean by that, Chief Constable? Well, it was out of his normal bracket financially. Not on this occasion, though. Anyway, we discussed his articles over the meal. He told me that he was researching into current attitudes to uh, law enforcement. He said his own opinion was that not enough attention was paid to the opinions of those who actually had to enforce the law. The police? Yes. Yes, and what did you say? Well, I agreed with him at this stage. And then he said that his publishers might be willing to help in more ways than the printed word. At this stage, we were discussing the fact that our force is undermanned, seriously undermanned, and the reasons for it. Galway said that what we needed was publicity, not sympathy. Yes. Will you tell the court what he meant by publicity, Chief Constable? What the witness thought the accusement is pure conjecture, Mr. Pass. I apologise, my lord. Uh, what did he say, Chief Constable? Well, he said that what we, the police, needed was a voice. Uh, the kind of voice that the authorities couldn't afford to ignore. In so many words, if we were unable to get the tools we needed to do the job through normal channels... Yes, what tools were those? Uh, in his opinion? More massive recruitment, better pay to encourage recruitment, and freedom from petty interference by, well, by the professional sociologists, especially the last. Yes, and if you couldn't get them through those channels... Then our negotiating body would have to make way for others. People prepared to use different methods. What sort of methods? Radical ones. Yes, how radical? Methods that hadn't been tried before. Uh, such as strikes? Uh, yeah, uh, refrain from leading your witness, please, Mr. Parsons. I apologise, my lord. Uh, Chief Constable, uh, did the accused mention any method in particular? Yes, uh, strike action. He said it could paralyse the country faster than any tuppenny halfpenny miners' stoppage. But it was important to avoid what the miners couldn't, public resentment. Uh, Galway suggested to me that if enough feeling were created, a strike might be unnecessary. But if it should come to the crunch, then the government would get the blame and not the police, which is where he could help. How? Well, he said his sponsors were willing to publicise the police's case where it mattered most, in the media, via articles, books, even lectures and seminars. Yes, was that all? No. He could also put funds into our hands, provided they were the right hands, for our own use. Yes. What use would that have been? Well, entertaining, mostly. He said that was essential if we were to lobby people of influence. He said that I was a case in point. Of course, he was a, a little drunk at the time. Yes. Uh, was any uh, actual figure mentioned? Oh, yes, several. One in the hundreds, one in the thousands. But as I say, he was... Um... A little drunk at the time, yes. <laughs> now, well, th this Christmas present, or rather this New Year's present, came without strings attached? Not quite. In return, I was invited to supply him with the names of any senior police officers I knew who might support militant action of the kind he had in mind. Uh, Galway claimed to have proof that there was already a silent majority who would. Yes, and how did you react to that? I told him I knew of no senior police officers who fitted that description. Yes, I see. So, uh, that was an end to the matter? No, he had another suggestion. What was that? That I should keep him informed of, or better still, give him access to, any top-level home office directives I might receive, especially those concerning public order. Yes. Now, professionally speaking, would that constitute a breach of police regulations? If it occurred, it would, yes. Did you agree? No. I asked him if he'd already had any access to top-level home office directives. He quoted me an example of what he took to be current Home Office thinking on the immigrant communities, which was quite inaccurate. Yes. What was that example? 
I don't think it would serve any purpose to repeat it. Yes, I see, as you choose. Uh, please continue, Chief Constable. Well, I then asked him if he could give me the names of any of his uh, silent majority, those willing to strike for a better deal. Uh, Galway just winked as if we were old friends and said, uh, need to know. Need to know? Yes. Uh, might I be in on the joke? Oh, I'm sorry, my lord. It's a common phrase among the espionage community, meaning you never let your contact know more than he needs to know to uh, fulfil the job you require from him. Oh, sounds like something out of James Bond. Yes, well, as I say, he was... Uh... At the time, <laughs> yes. yes. Mm. Nevertheless, it is a, a, a common practice, my lord. My lord. Uh, so, what took place subsequently, Chief Constable? Well, something of a silence. Then he, uh, Galway, got very chatty on the subject of cricket. Cricket? Yes, the Australian fast bowlers in particular. I don't suppose you want to hear his views on them. Uh, no, no. Uh, Mr Galway will have a chance to testify on his own behalf. So, the evening ended quite merrily, as it were. Well, no, not quite. Just as we were getting up from the table, he said that there was no hurry if I wished to think over his proposal more calmly. And to show good faith, he was willing to leave me a little bonus, free of charge. And he passed it across the table. Yes. Um, may the witness be shown Exhibit 1, please? Is this what the defendant gave you, Chief Constable? Yes. Now, his lordship and members of the jury do have copies of it. Uh, will you tell the court what this uh, document is? Uh, my lord. No, I'm sorry, I rephrase the question. Uh, at the time, what did you take it to be? Well, as its heading suggests, it's a pamphlet put out by WAG, the Workers' Activist Group. Yes, is this organisation known to you? Oh, very well. It's a, a radical left splinter movement. I'm not an expert in this field, but you could describe its ideals as Trotskyist. Yes, I see. Now, uh, Chief Constable, could you please read out for us uh, paragraph three? It's marked there. Uh, the dispute at Garvey and Tomlin is precisely one of those battles that must be won if we are to bring down the present Labour administration. Otherwise, capitalism will stagger on with the weight of its crisis borne on the backs of the working class. But the bosses are not going to reveal their empty hand voluntarily. They and their police dogs must be provoked into it by all means available, by any means, including the violence they themselves employ. Yes. Now, uh, did the name Garvey and Tomlin have any special relevance for you? Well, at the time, there was a dispute there concerning redundancies uh, involving pickets. Uh, you don't need me to say anything about the unemployment rate in Fulchester. No, no. Well, as you know, it was a long-standing dispute with a certain element of, uh, of violence, uh, and WAG had given it their total support. Including the violence, you mean? Yes, apparently. In other words, on the basis of this leaflet, there were grounds for prosecuting several of its members. Was this done? No. Why not? Well, I couldn't be sure of the authenticity of this document. Yes, I see. So, what happened after that, Chief Constable? Now, then we both left. Did you meet again subsequently? I put the whole incident in the hands of the CID. I never saw him again until today. Thank you, Mr. Paul. <coughs> Miss Denham? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, do you normally su suspect people who buy you dinner? Of course not. Uh, only in the case of my client, apparently. Well, as I said, he wasn't normally in a position to afford it. Plus the fact that he was unusually well-dressed. Oh, I see. Uh, I noticed that you don't happen to be in uniform today, Chief Constable. Is that relevant? Uh, not if you say so. And nevertheless, your suspicions weren't so strong as to prevent you from enjoying Mr. Galway's hospitality. Well, it seemed to matter to him. You were doing him a favour, in other words. I'm not a rude person. No. They serve a very nice dinner at the Falconry, wouldn't you say? You must have been there yourself. Uh, once or twice. Now, have you any idea what the bill came to? Oh, none at all. In fact, I offered to pay half, but the waiter told me that that had already been taken care of. That was generous, don't you think? Not really. I think he thought we were in America. Uh, how, how do you mean? That corruption in this country started from the top downwards. Uh, well, if, uh, as you suggest, he truly believed that, uh, the logical inference is that he sought you out in particular because he had some reason to think you corrupt. No, it was because we knew each other. Yes, my point exactly. It was a lively, pleasant, even animated dinner between two men of equal intelligence and education. It wasn't that. Uh, how long had you known each other? Oh, we were acquaintances in the army just after the war in Libya. Oh, not friends? No. Um, didn't the defendant lend you some money to help you through during the time you were getting demobbed? Twenty pounds, which were repaid. Oh. 
And now, at what stage did you begin to discuss police affairs? Oh, we were having a brandy by then. Yeah, after the meal? Yes. Uh, which was accompanied by wine, I take it. Two bottles. And conversation. Oh, yes. Mr. Galway got quite, um, quite eloquent. Yes, you've already said that several times. In fact, you said he was drunk. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, was my client or was he not drunk? Well, if you prefer the word, yes, he was. By which I presume you wish us to understand that you were in full control of your faculties. Well, my Lord, this line of questioning is taking us nowhere, apart from being rather insulting to this witness. What exactly do you intend to demonstrate, Miss Denham? Since the case against my client depends on what may or may not have been said on a particular occasion, uh, that he was misunderstood then and is being misrepresented here today, I would be grateful if the witness would be permitted to answer, my Lord. Very well. Uh, thank you, my Lord. Um, uh, Chief Constable. Uh, the answer is yes. I think you'll find that the uh, police can hold their alcohol better than most. Yes, I'm sorry to keep you any longer than is necessary. You see, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, say that your memory is, is any way at fault. It's just in one or two details. Uh, for example? Well, for example, the um, first topic that seems to have upset you, militancy within your own force. Now, you don't deny that it exists. No. What is your own attitude? Well, if you want to know, I think the value of the police is always underestimated by society. In what way just now? Well, let's just say that the average police officer gets paid less than the minimum union rate for a go-go dancer. <laughs> uh, some members of the force are in favour of affiliation to the TUC, I believe. Yes, but that doesn't alter the fact that we're under a statutory obligation not to strike. Yeah, precisely. Now, I put it to you that what my client actually said was that strike action could only be undertaken under different circumstances. Yes, he also said those circumstances had arrived. Yes, of course you warned him that he was breaking the law by saying that. Of course. Then why did you fail to mention that in your previous evidence? <laughs> I should have thought that was obvious. Yes, I suggest that you had forgotten the fact. No. Very well, in that case, if inciting the police to strike is a crime, will you tell us why you remained at the table? Well, not all Dixons of Doc Green, you know. Uh, how do you mean? Well, I was interested to find out how the mind of a man like that worked. Investigation, you might say. You seem to find that hard to understand. Uh, on the contrary, I find that very easy to understand. You see, that is why Mr. Galway wanted to talk to you. What is? Investigation. He never said so. Oh, did you tell him what was going on in your mind? Not entirely. No. Well, at the risk of repeating myself, there we have it. Two men of equal intelligence and education having a discussion. No, your client wanted more than discussion and said so. Depending upon the accuracy of your memory. I'm trained to depend on it. I see. Now, may we now turn to this leaflet, uh, which, uh, so it is alleged, was given you to be used as forged evidence against the workers' activist group. I suggest that it was nothing of the sort. It was merely a simple example of what the extreme left of this country are capable of, and nothing more. <laughs> it would be no use to man or beast. At what stage did you decide that uh, Mr. Galway had committed a criminal offence? As soon as he offered to give me concrete help to organise a police strike. In other words, from the word go? More or less. And you remained sitting at the table? Now, uh, this conversation took place on the 4th of January. When did you first report it to another officer? I'm sorry. If you think that your rank merits special treatment... Several days later. Yeah, how many days? Four or five. Well, why the delay? I suggest to you... I suggest to you that it was that you were not convinced of his guilt. Then you are mistaken. The police do not waste the taxpayer's money chasing up every harmless <coughs> crank they come across. The question is to decide whether he is harmless. Yes, we're in agreement. Fortunately, the jury are here to decide that. The point is that you were in two minds. Yes about what action to take. In any case, I did have other matters to attend to at the same time. Oh, yes. Now, is it a fact that you were originally not prepared to appear as a witness in this trial? I don't know where you get your information from. Are you going to bring any evidence to support that, Miss Denham? No, my lord, but I do think that it is a legitimate question. Chief Constable? Yes, I'll answer it. No, it is not a fact. 
Isn't it true that you only did so because you were afraid your name might be dragged into it, uh, possibly even to testify on behalf of Mr. Galway? I will answer that too. No, it is not true. So in your mind, there was never any doubt as to his guilt? I'm sorry? Oh, no, none. And after four or five days, what action did you instruct your CID to take? To investigate him. Ah, how were they able to do that? By the telephone number he left me. Oh, he left you his telephone number. Uh, you didn't mention that previously either. Well, I wasn't asked. But professionally speaking, wouldn't you say that that was the act of an innocent man? Well, I thought it was an act of a fool. Simpsons. And you are a Detective Inspector at Fooster City CID. Yes, sir. Now, Detective Inspector Brannigan, do you recall any particular duty you were asked to perform on January the 10th last? Yes, sir. Acting on information received from my Chief Constable, I interviewed a Francis John Galway at the Raven Guest House outside Birmingham. Yes, will you tell the court what you found there? Uh, you may use your notes, if you please. Thank you, sir. I could call first in the morning. They said to be back for lunch. When I returned around two o'clock, he was in the bar. Yes, sir. Do you recognize the man you saw? Yes, sir. The person sitting in the dock. I then said I would like to have a word about the strike at Garvey and Tomlin. He invited me for a drink in his room. When we were up there, I declined a drink. We then discussed the situation at Garvey and Tomlin. Galway said it was undesirable. I agreed. And I asked him if he was in a position to provide me with evidence that would link the workers' activist group with any violence that had taken place there. Yes. Did you say what kind of evidence? Oh, I was going to mention that, sir. I specifically said fate or otherwise. He then asked me if I knew Chief Constable Vaughan, and I said I did. And then he, well, um, relaxed and said I should have said so in the first place. Yes, what do you mean by relaxed, Detective Inspector? Well, I think he took me for a sympathizer, sir, because he said that would all depend on whether Mr. Vaughan had thought any more about his offer on whether we could cooperate in organizing a real police strike. And I asked him if what he said to Mr. Vaughan was true, that he was ready to back it financially. And he said his sponsor would. And I tried to find out who that was, but he wouldn't tell me. He said it wasn't my problem. Offered me a whiskey. And then I asked his permission to search his room. Yes. How did uh, Mr. Galway uh, react to that? A surprise, but he agreed. Yes. And what did you find there? Now, there was a quantity of literature about, mostly of an intellectual kind. But I found in a chest of drawers several hundred copies of a leaflet called uh, Why Garvey and Tomlin Matters. Yes. Uh, would you look at Exhibit 1, uh, please? Now, is this one of those leaflets that you found, Detective Inspector? Uh, no, sir. This copy was shown to me by Mr. Vaughan. It has his mark. Otherwise, it's identical to the ones I found. Yes, I see. Uh, please continue, Detective Inspector. I then asked the defendant uh, who its publishers were. He wouldn't answer that. He asked to go to the toilet. The toilet? Oh, yes, sir. It was just along the corridor, and I kept the door of his room open. And after about five minutes, which at least that, I knocked on the door of the toilet, and he came out. Yes. And when I went inside, the window frame appeared to have been broken open. Um, uh, on what floor is Mr. Galway's room? Uh, the first floor, sir. Yes, I see. I then invited him to accompany me to a police station to ask further questions, and told him I'd be taking uh, several copies of the Garvey and Tomlin leaflet with me. He said I had no right to do so, and I explained the law to him. Yes. Shall I go on, sir? Oh, yes, if you will. He then accompanied me to West Roxdale Station, and he asked to see Chief Constable Vaughan. Miss Vaughan was out at the time. He then asked and was allowed to telephone Inspector Fleming, who was also unavailable. Yes, uh, Inspector Fleming will be giving evidence later, members of the jury. Uh, please continue, Detective Inspector. In the presence of other officers, I then searched the accused with his permission and found in his possession uh, several visiting cards belonging to a, an organization called the Institute for Democratic Solidarity in London. When questioned, Mr. Galway said he was employed by them as a journalist. And after that, he refused to answer further questions. Later, he was uh, charged with offences against the Police Act. Yes. Was any attempt made to investigate whether he had worked for this organisation? Oh, there was. They said they'd never heard of any Mr. Galway. So you concluded he was lying? Uh, no, sir. On the contrary. Yes, I see. Thank you, Detective Inspector. Miss Denham? You've been admirably brisk so far, Detective Inspector Brannigan. I hope to be equally so. Uh, now, my client actually invited you to his room. He did? 
where you asked him if he could furnish you with evidence that would implicate the workers' activist group in illegal activities. Yes. Uh, you misled him as to your intentions, didn't you? At the time, yes. Now, isn't that considered a dirty practice for the police to follow nowadays? Mm, only in some cases. Now, did my client offer any objection to your searching his room? No. Now, this leaflet that you found so uh, carefully hidden away in a chest of drawers... Why, Garvey and Tomlin Matters? Uh, that one. Now, did Mr Galway himself ever use the word faked? He said it expressed in print what the Trotskyists were achieving in fact. Uh, did he use the word faked? No, madam. Now, as you said, it was intellectual literature, really, wasn't it? Uh, meant for discussion. Not that. If you, if you look at the bottom, it was signed WAG, W-A-G. It was meant for distribution, well, madam. Have you any evidence that it was, in fact, distributed? No, madam. When he came out of the lavatory, you say that the window showed signs of having been broken open. Now, uh, did you think that he had tried to escape? It crossed my mind, yes, madam. You didn't smell anything in particular when you went in? I beg your pardon? I'm sorry to offend your sensitivity, but you didn't detect the smell of vomit. Uh, well, yes. Would it surprise you to learn that the accused is a man of equal, if not uh, greater, sensitivity? Uh, in the physical sense, I mean. I'm not with you, ma'am. It never crossed your mind that he had gone there, because of his nerves, uh, to be sick. No. And that was why the window was open. Now, the fact that the Institute for Democratic Solidarity said they had never heard of Mr. Galway seemed to suggest a sinister connection to you. Am I right? Uh, I considered it possible, yes. Well, have you any idea of the number of freelance researchers they employ? No, their answer didn't surprise me, that's all. Why? Well, it fits into a certain pattern. You sound as if you're an expert on such organizations, Inspector. I've had four years' experience with the special branch, madam. Yes, I see. Uh, are you aware that uh, the said institute is a long, a long subscribing member of uh, BSL? I, uh, you have heard of it. British Society for Liberty, I'm aware of that, madam. Yes. And are you aware that BSL contains many highly respected members of our community, including some of our own members of Parliament? Yes. And are you seriously suggesting that such people would allow themselves to be connected with an organisation that was in any way suspicious? It's not my job to suggest. I mean, you haven't been exactly straight with us yourself, have you? I don't follow you, madam. I mean, when you investigated the Institute for Democratic Solidarity, you were not on your own, were you? No. Who was with you? I was accompanied by a member of a special branch. Who will not be giving evidence here today, I believe. It's not the usual practice, ma'am. And now, can you tell me whether the Institute for Democratic Solidarity has been investigated further? I'm afraid I couldn't say. Now, you said in your evidence in chief that Mr. Galway was later charged. Now, will you perhaps say why it is that although you interviewed him on January the 10th, he was not charged until four weeks later? The documents went to the Director of Public Prosecutions yes, first. Yes, that's a convenient reason. I disagree. You or your superiors? It's obligatory when an offence like this is involved. Now, isn't it a fact that the police have recently come under fire for being too right-wing? I wouldn't know about that. Now, I suggest to you that this present case is no more than a public relations tactic on behalf of your force. I wouldn't know about that either. And I suggest that you and your superiors thought twice before proceeding against Mr. Galway with this charge, uh, Detective Inspector Brannigan. Yes, that's true. We could have always had him under the Official Secrets Act or for conspiring to pervert the course of justice. You can take your pick, madam. The cases in Falchester are fictitious. Join us again tomorrow when the Queen against Galway will be resumed in the Crown Court. Francis John Galway has been charged with inciting members of the police force to commit breaches of discipline contrary to the Police Act. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public who are eligible for jury service and whose names appear on the electoral register.
Yesterday, the court heard from Chief Constable Vaughan how Galway had offered him forged evidence aimed against a left-wing organisation called the Workers' Activist Group, plus financial backing in the event of a police strike for better conditions. Today is the second day of the prosecution. <laughs> Now, uh, Inspector Plowy, when you uh, met the accused in the Dreamland Club, did he mention his own job? He told me he was a lecturer in sociology and that he was in the midst of preparing a series of lectures about the uh, comparative police methods in different countries. That's why he enjoyed talking to me. And he asked if I'd be interested in providing additional material of the sort he couldn't get through the usual research. Yes, did he say what sort of material he had in mind? He said he might sound like an intellectual, but what he was really interested in was the feelings of the ordinary policeman about his job about how the country was being run. He said he'd pay for any help. Yes, sir. How did you react to that? Well, I was flattered, but I told him I wouldn't take any money. Yes. Please continue, well, uh, Inspector, please. We arranged to meet at my house uh, about a week later. And when he came, the defendant spent about two hours with me. Uh, we talked mainly about the problem of our image, the police's. I mean, the fact that our job is uh, twice as dangerous as a fireman's, but we don't get half the public respect they do. Uh, Mr. Galway is very sympathetic. Yes. Now, can you recall any uh, particular question that he asked you? Yes. Uh, he asked me whether there were any circumstances where I'd be pre prepared to take a firm line against uh, certain offences, uh, where it was in my power to do so. Yes, what sort of offences? Uh, picketings, demonstrations, muggings. I thought it was a strange question and I told him that the police already did take a firm line, uh, providing the law had been broken. Uh, Mr. Galway just laughed and he said it was a hypothetical question. And on the way out, he asked me, uh, he offered me some uh, money for the interview. Yes, how much? Well, I never got to that because I refused. Uh, but he insisted on leaving me with uh, an inflatable duck. An inflatable duck? Uh, yes, it was, uh, it was for my daughter. Uh, we'd been talking about her in the Dreamland Club. Oh, yes, I see. A and was that the last time you saw one another? Uh, no, uh, sometime later I received a telephone call and... Mr. Galway asked me if I fancied a free holiday in Italy. Yes. Go on, if you don't mind, Inspector. Well, it seemed there was a, a law and order conference being held there, and he'd been invited to bring a guest. Now, I asked him in what capacity I'd be going along, and he said, uh, just as an observer. But if I was called upon to uh, say a few words, it'd be only good manners to my host to do so. Yes, and what did you reply? Uh, agreed. Yes, and uh, you travelled to Milan on November the 8th, I think. Yes. So, what happened there? Well, we arrived the uh, night before the conference and uh, Mr. Galway took me on a tour of the red light district. He seemed to know it pretty well. Anyway, while we were there, he produced a document which he said he'd like me to read at the conference. Yes. yes. Uh, may the witness be shown Exhibit 2, please? Uh, my Lord, I don't see what purpose this uh, document will serve. As I understand it, any breach of police discipline arises uh, not from what, or may, what may or not have happened in Milan, uh, but from Inspector Fleming's having attended the conference in the first place. Yes, I agree, my lord, but the document also goes as to the extent of the breach. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think it is perfectly permissible. As your lordship directs. Thank you, my lord. Now, uh, Inspector Fleming, do you recognise this document? Yes, it's the one I was given. Yes, did you agree to read it at this conference? Yes. Yes, would you please read it to the court? Manifesto for modern Britain. Our nation is rapidly approaching the moment in its history when a government of national emergency will become necessary, which means a government of national unity beyond party or class. Are those of us uh, prepared to follow such an ideal are aware of? Do you want me to go on? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So, you read this in front of a gathering of uh, how many people were present? It was about uh, 50 or 60. But the point is that being Italian, I didn't think they understood a word. Yes, did they? Well, it turned out there was uh, an interpreter present. I mean, there were people from the French and Spanish police there. I wasn't the only one. I see. Did the accused speak at all? He just introduced me in Italian, but apart from that, nothing. Yes. Uh, please continue, Inspector. Well, when the uh, manifesto was translated, there was a, a great deal of applause. And then I was asked some questions through the interpreter. Yes, do you recall any of them? Only one. I was asked whether the police in Britain were organised politically. Politically? Yes, whether we had any way of protecting our interests the way they do in uh, some of the other countries. And I told them that the police in Britain were non-political by tradition. Well, that brought about a certain amount of amusement, but Galway seemed well pleased. And he invited a few of us to have dinner with him in the old city. Turned out some local bigwig was paying. 
Yes, was this a, a normal dinner? Well, it started out like that. Uh, there was a great deal of uh, hospitality, a lot of toast to friendship, that sort of thing. Then one of them got up and he said in English that he thought the war had all been one big mistake. If only Britain and Italy had fought on the same side, we'd still be running the Mediterranean. And that we were learning the, the facts of life the hard way in Ulster now. Anyway, I wanted to buy some wine to return the hospitality, but the man at the head of the table, the, uh, the host, he told me that it was his organization that had sponsored the conference. And as the uh, official representative of the British police, I was his guest. Now, that was the first time I heard anything about that. Yes, the accused had never suggested to you that you were attending this conference as an official spokesman for the British police force. Never. And when I said that to him, he just, uh, he just laughed and he said, uh, no harm had been done, possibly even good. Yes, did he explain what he meant? Well, he said I was among friends and it was the sort of thing that could lead to promotion. To promotion, yes. Now, did you by any chance, Inspector, find out what organisation was paying for all this? Yes, I made sure that. Uh, a host told me it was the uh, Movimento Italiano Socialista. Yes, you're quite certain of that? Oh, yes, I made a note of that when I got back to the hotel. Yes, I don't think my learned friend would dispute that as a known fascist party in Italy. Yes, uh, please go on, Inspector. Well, uh, then our host asked me what I uh, made of Mr. Galway, and I told him I hardly knew the man. And then he said that they've my both Lord, been together uh, in this... this is hearsay evidence. Well, it was said in the presence of the accused, my Lord. Yes, I realise that. Inspector Fleming, did the accused hear what was said? I'm not sure, my Lord. Well, did he have a chance to confirm or deny it? Well, uh, not with all that noise going on. Oh, well, this is clearly inadmissible. I'm grateful for your Lordship's guidance. Uh, please continue, Inspector. Well, it was getting pretty late by then, and uh, then this gentleman, uh, the host, he uh, suggested calling up some women if I felt like one. Yes, and uh, um, did you? My wife was back at the hotel. Ah, her trip had been paid for too. That's right. Yes. Anyway, we flew back the next day. Yes. Now, let me get this quite straight, Inspector Fleming. You attended a law and order conference in Milan without prior permission from your superiors. Yes. Yes. Was that a, a breach of police discipline? Yes. And when the accused represented you as an official spokesman for the British police, you didn't deny it? Well, I denied it to him. But not to your hosts. It was too late by then. Yes, I see. Now, after returning to England, did you have any subsequent contact with the accused? Yes, twice, sir. Uh, sometime in December, he telephoned me and asked if I'd write an article on the Milan Conference for a magazine he worked for. He said uh, that he'd help and there'd be a fee. I told him I wanted nothing further to do with him. And then on January the 10th, I received a telephone call at work, and I told the desk sergeant to say that I was out. Yes, that was the day that Mr. Galway was arrested. That's why I tried to telephone me. Yes. Anyway, the following day, uh, Detective Inspector Brannigan, an officer from the special branch, visited me at home, and I told them everything I knew. Yes, and you also furnished them with uh, Exhibit 2, I believe, a manifesto for a modern Britain. Yes, and uh, I'd written the menu of that dinner on the back of it for my wife. I mean, the whole thing seemed a bit of a laugh at the time. Yes, thank you, Inspector Fleming. Miss Denham. Uh, <clears throat> what's your opinion of my client? Well, if you pardon the expression, I think he's a right bastard. Do you mean a right-wing bastard? Yes, he's that too. Well, I mean, by and large, you two seem to have got on rather well together, wouldn't you say? I mean, you seem to have found plenty to talk about. Uh, what are your politics, Inspector? I don't have any. Oh, that is refreshing. A police officer without views. Now, while we're at it, spare us yours, Miss Denham. Uh, yes, of course, my lord. You see, I can't help thinking that uh, you're not being entirely honest with us. I mean, don't you have any attitude to your own job? I mean, do you think you get the backing you deserve and need to do it properly? No. Ah. Uh, in what way? Well, we get no thanks, either financially or otherwise, for taking care of the world's dirty linen for them, that's for sure. Oh, you feel strongly on the subject? I do. Would you consider yourself a militant? Definitely not. Oh, but uh, you wouldn't ever be, uh, you wouldn't describe yourself as someone who would be prepared to do anything about it? Like what? Uh, like attend a conference on law and order. I told you it was a holiday. I'm not political. Uh, no. No more than the accused is. Now, do you speak Italian? No, madam. So you have no idea of what was said at this conference at all? I know it was organised by the MSI. 
uh, Movimento Socialista Italiano. Uh, are you aware that socialista means socialist? Oh, I think my learned friend is trying to confuse this witness. It's a well-known fact that the Nazis called themselves National Socialists. I really don't think you'll help your case with terminology, Miss Dillon. Your Lordship suggests. Now, do you recall the name of your host at this dinner in Milan? Yes, it was a Signor Fra... Uh, Farina. Farina, yes. That's right. And are you aware that Signor Farina is a senator in the Italian Parliament? I'm not acquainted with Italian politics. Well, nor am I, but uh, the whole thing seems to be perfectly respectable, doesn't it? I mean, after all, your wife was invited too. Oh, yes. And if it did strike you in any way suspicious, uh, why didn't you inform uh, your superiors of your trip on your return? Apparently, you even retained possession of the Manifesto for Modern Britain because you had written a menu on the back of it. I told you, it all seemed like a laugh at the time. Then why didn't you get permission from your superiors in the first place? Because I was tricked. How long have you held your present rank, Inspector? Six years. Uh, six years? And you are trying to tell us that my client tricked you? Yes. You see, um, Mr. Galway feels that it was uh, you who misled him, and he will testify to that. <laughs> Me? Well, he naturally assumed, well, perhaps Miss Aikenley, that a responsible officer such as yourself would normally seek official approval before attending any conference. I told him at the dinner. What did you tell him? That a responsible officer who considers him himself underpaid took the chance of a free holiday? Something like that. Well, it seems that you uh, both misunderstood each other. Fortunately, no harm has been done except to my client. You haven't been suspended from duty, I gather, Inspector. The expression is relieved of duty. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been reprimanded. That's all. Just means that I'll stay in this rank until the day I retire. Read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What is your name? Uh, Francis John Galway. And your last address was the Raven Guest House, Forest Road, Birmingham. That's right. What is your job? I'm a sociological researcher. Now, what was the last piece of research that you were engaged on? A law and order study based on Fulchester. Now, why did you choose Fulchester? Well, it's an ordinary town that gives you a cross-section, unlike Manchester, say. O also, I was brought up here. Thank you. Now, I'd like to take the allegations that have been made against you in this court one by oh, one. Uh, and, now, uh, during the... uh, uh, Chief Constable Vaughan and I have been friends in the army. Or rather, I thought we had. Now, and that was another reason. <laughs> during your dinner together on January the 4th, it is claimed that you offered to provide the police with financial backing to organise strike action. Now, is this correct? No. I and my employers... Uh, the Institute for Democratic Solidarity. Correct. Now, we, we offered concrete backing to help the police publicise their case for a fairer deal th th through the media. Now, did you mention to Chief Constable Vaughan a figure somewhere in the thousands? Well, I merely remarked that that was what a properly organised campaign would take. Now, did you claim that there is already a silent majority of police officers who would be willing to support strike action? <laughs> no. You don't, in fact, know one, do you? Oh, yes, yeah, several. Well, that, that, that was... One of my areas of research. Did you also ask Chief Constable Vaughan, in return for this support, uh, to be allowed access to privileged Home Office uh, directives? Absolutely not. Well, I mean, that would have cost him his job. No, what, what, what I wanted was news of what people were thinking without getting it filtered through newspapers. That was all. And now, uh, this leaflet you gave him, uh, Exhibit 1, now, was this, as has been alleged, a forgery which you encouraged him to use to prosecute a Trotskyist organisation? Well, hardly, since I was the author of it. Are you yourself? Yes, I mean, it was a... ...for literature among the workers' activist group. I mean, Vaughan knew it wasn't meant to be genuine. Well, it is signed, W.A.G. Authenticity. See, I wrote it for my lectures. I thought he might be able to use it for training. It's amazing the reactions one gets. Now, uh, Detective Inspector Brannigan found 200 copies in your room. Well, I was hoping for 200 interested students. I mean, subversive organisations were another area of research. 
Now, how do you account for Mr. Vaughan's having misinterpreted you? Well, we talked about a great many things that evening. He obviously has retained any one or two of them. You see, when he said that I was a little drunk, I returned the compliment. I mean, I even left my telephone number with him. Now, may we turn to Inspector Fleming's evidence. Was your meeting in the Dreamland Club accidental? Pure coincidence. Now, he and his wife subsequently flew with you to a law and order conference in Milan. Now, under what arrangement? Well, he was under no obligation except that of any guest. I mean, I, I expected him to have obtained his superior's permission, but quite honestly, I think the snob value of a trip with all expenses paid got the better of him. Now, when later that night he told you that he had not in fact done so, um, you apparently told him that it was the kind of thing that could lead to promotion. Now, what did you mean by that? I'm afraid Inspector Fleming doesn't have much of a sense of humour. He, he's also more than a little vicious. Now, on the 10th of January, you were visited at your lodging by Detective Inspector Brannigan. Now, what was your initial reaction? I thought he was an acquaintance of Chief Constable Vaughan's. Uh, he was friendly, seemed interested. I offered him a whiskey. Now, how long did this interest of his last? I suppose as long as it took him to search my room. You asked him if you could go to the toilet, I believe. Yes. Now, was that, as has been alleged, in order to escape? No. What did you do there? I was sick. After you were taken to West Roxdale Station, apparently you tried to telephone Chief Constable Vaughan and then uh, Inspector Fleming. I thought there'd been a mistake. Who were both of them unavailable? Yes, I never expected to be treated like that. Now, um, this research was undertaken on behalf of the Institute for Democratic Solidarity. Uh, now, will you tell the court how you came to be commissioned by that organization? It was Libya, really. Yeah. I'm sorry? I, I was stationed there just after the war we're, we're with Mr. Vaughan. You see, I'd studied Italian, so when we took over the place from Italy, it came in quite useful. And then we were demobbed. And after they got their independence in 48, I went back there to teach English. Uh, yes, of course, um, it wasn't real independence, just the Foreign Office variety. Uh, Mr. Gorway, and the day, please... Yes, I'm coming to that in a minute. The day Colonel Gaddafi made his revolution, most of us out there were in favour. Now, there's a man. I mean, he, he got rid of the parasite class forever. <laughs> Unfortunately, I left around about the same time. It was then that uh, I was introduced to the idea. Uh -huh. how? through a mutual concern for wider issues. Now, will you tell the court uh, what your relationship with them is? Yes, I was commissioned on a freelance basis to do research for a series of articles they had in mind. On what subject? The, the collapse of Western democracy. Now, you are the author of two recent books, are you not? Aspects of Contemporary Morality and South Africa, The Truth. You've been misled. Um, the, the first was a collection of articles. Oh, but uh, equally academic, not to say harmless in its aims. Excuse me, but what I write is not harmless. Uh, I despise that. Uh, look, when you it's not harmless to I... want a society based on something better than statistics, something people can trust. But in fact, now, you have to understand there's, there's very little of it left. If two little boys are playing in the street and one gives the other an apple, all the communists say is, is this is an example of, of, of now, Mr. relative Galway. relationship. Look, please. So if, when you came to Fulchester, what was your purpose? To investigate democracy. To identify the rotten apples, not create them. Now, do you consider that Chief Constable Vaughan and Inspector Fleming understood that purpose? No. No, I, I have no hard feelings. In fact, I'm genuinely sorry for what happened to Inspector Fleming. But if Britain's future is in the hands of people like them, God help it. Thank you. You seem to be a much misunderstood man, Mr. Galway. Oh, um, are you a member of the Dreamland Club? No. How did you gain admittance? I mean, you realise it's for members only. Yes, uh, I can't remember now. I see. Yeah. Uh, when did you leave Libya? Uh, 1971. Yes, and you said that is when you were first introduced to the Institute for Democratic Solidarity. I don't believe so. Uh. Oh, yes, you did. Don't believe so. <laughs> uh, that's your lordship. You have a note of this? Oh, um, no, I'm afraid not. I suggest we consult the shorthand record. Could you just look back and see if you... Yes, my lord. Um. 
Yeah, about it. At the same time, that was when I was introduced to the IDS. Oh, Sorry, you. my fault. <laughs> In fact, you weren't employed by them until 1975. Not employed, no. no. What were you doing in the intervening period? I was looking around for something new. I still had a little of the indispensable, say, for my teaching. Yes, you prefer that word to money? Sorry? You prefer euphemisms? Why should I? Well, I suppose because they're only halfway to being lies. Actually, we're doing what actors call resting. Don't follow. Well, you were on the dough. <clears throat> ah, very good. <laughs> yes. Now, how much were you paid by the IDS for this uh, series in Western democracy? Oh, I need a moment to work that out. Yes, I'm sure you would. Uh, my lord, my learned friend is insinuating yet again without saying what he means. Yes, I apologise, my lord. I withdraw the question. How much were you paid for taking Inspector Fleming to Milan? I wasn't. I would have answered your first question, too. Now, according to Chief Constable Vaughan, you promised him the kind of voice the authorities couldn't afford to ignore, which could paralyse this nation faster than any tuppenny halfpenny minor stoppage. I didn't promise anything. But you employed those words. Uh, well, it's possible. Yes. Now, what did you mean? I want him to realise the police aren't just another service. What are they? They're like nurses. They're used. Now, are you aware that it's illegal for the police force to go on strike? Yes, of course. But I put it to you that you were persuading uh, uh, Chief Constable Vaughan to support a strike. You can put it to me by all means, but you know that I'm against industrial action. Otherwise, I wouldn't have opposed the pickets at Garvey and Tomlin. Yes. Could the witness be shown um, Exhibit 1, please? Now, is this the uh, document that you gave to uh, Chief Constable Vaughan, Mr. Yes. Orwell, on Trotsky's organisations? Yes. Now, will you read for us, please, uh, paragraph 5? Until the dispute we are engaged in at Garvey and Tomlin is repeated and won nationwide, there can be no workers' democracy here as has flourished for 60 years in the Soviet Union. Yes. You see, you're not even really a very good liar, are you, Mr. Corway? It's fairly well known that there's one system that the Trotskyists hate almost as much as capitalism, it's Soviet-style communism. And organisations such as the Workers' Activist Group they can't normally afford the sort of printing we see here. I put it to you that you gave this forged document uh, to Chief Constable Vaughan in order to induce him to initiate a false accusation against the Workers' Activist Group. It was just meant for students. I mentioned that before. Yes, I seem to remember you saying you were expecting several hundred of them. At the time I was. <laughs> From where? Look, I, I mean, I, I, I've never been anti-left. Good gracious, I, 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 I mean... That's what Mr. Vaughan couldn't understand. I even asked him whether he'd, whether he'd work under a Marxist government if the time came. I suppose you're going to tell us that's what you meant by um, uh, a government of national emergency and you're a manifesto, are you? Don't you listen. I, I said beyond party or class. I mean, look, look at Gaddafi. Look at, uh, have you ever read any classics? Um, I'm afraid not. Well, well re read about the collapse uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Roman Empire and then... Look around you. What are you trying to say? Well, let me put it another way. If you ever get the chance, watch a shoal of fish in the sea. All free, all reacting as one. And then open a sardine tin. All reacting as one. That's the choice. Yes, well, uh, most right-wing philosophers tend to rely on pure emotion, Mr. Galway. Now, let me be quite clear about this. You told Chief Constable Vaughan that you were a freelance journalist doing a series on law and order. Is that correct? Yes. And you gave Inspector Fleming to understand that you were a sociology lecturer who was investigating comparative police methods in different countries. They might never have spoken to me otherwise. Surely that's reasonable. Yes. Now, subversive organisations were another area of research, I think you said. Yes. Yes. Now, can you tell us... Uh, which of these projected articles, books or lectures, in fact materialised? Well, none. They, they were dropped. Which is why I couldn't tell you exactly how much I was paid. Just like that, they were dropped? Yes. Do you know why? My Lord, I will be calling a representative of the uh, Institute for Democratic Solidarity tomorrow, and my learned friend can ask him that question then. Well, I, 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 I can my... tell you. 
because we've been turned into a scapegoat, a scarecrow, for the benefit of police public relations. If you want a farce, you have it. What farce, Mr. Well, Gorway? This trial, this exercise in promoting a more liberal image for your copper. I mean, there never has been a fascist conspiracy in this country, and there isn't now. The idea is just ludicrous. Well, um, if that were true, uh, why were you going to bother researching the subject in the first place? The case is in Fulchester are fictitious. Join us again tomorrow when the Queen against Galway will be concluded in the Crown Court. Francis Galway is charged with offences under the Police Act. He is alleged to have incited members of the force to commit breaches of discipline, acting on behalf of an organisation known as the Institute for Democratic Solidarity. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public who are eligible for jury service and whose names appear on the electoral register. You are Mary Ann Holt and you live at 42 Aston Crescent, Birmingham. Yes. Uh, are you acquainted with the defendant in this case? Yes. How? He was my husband. What is your profession? I'm a lecturer in At, sociology. Uh, Birmingham University, I believe. Yes. Now, Mrs. Holt, would you please tell the court, in your own words, what you know about the defendant? Yes. I first met Frank, uh, the defendant, in Libya. Uh, that was in 1954. Uh, he was teaching English there, and I was doing a job for the British Council in several of the Arab countries. Is that the sort of information you want? Oh, yes. Please proceed. We were married the following year. Frank was in love with the place. He had been from the start. When he first arrived there, there was only a small population of about 500,000 people, most of them Bedouin. We both of us despised what the British and Americans were doing. And uh, Mrs. Holt, perhaps if we could... I thought you wanted my own words. Uh, yes, I apologize. Well, it was a wonderful country, but overall it, it was miserable. Frank felt that. He never charged too much for his lessons. But there was so much corruption there that he lost out with the European community as well in the end. Uh, then in 1969, the colonel came along. A Gaddafi? Yes. I don't suppose Frank would like to admit this now, but he idolised the man. <laughs> Except, of course, for his ban on alcohol. Anyway, Gaddafi cleaned things up, and he nationalised all the big foreign corporations. Unfortunately, Frank's firm was one of them, and he lost his job. <laughs> he was the classic... Uh, yes? Well, he was the classic fly that gets squashed. After that, he finished with Libya. Um, we separated about the same time. Have you met subsequently? Oh, yes, on various occasions. And when was the last time? It was January of this year. I went to a room uh, in a guest house just outside Birmingham. And now, did you form any impression of him at that time? Of what he was thinking? Uh, thinking and doing. Oh, yes. He told me that he thought all countries ought to set their own houses in order before they started on others. And he said he was glad he hadn't stayed in Libya because he'd found a worthwhile job here at last. What was that? Research. Oh, you only had to look at the room. <laughs> well, apart from a few tins of baked beans, it was just a mass of books. Books and old magazine articles with his notes in the margins. There were practically no personal possessions at all. Yes. Now, Mrs. Holt, in your experience of the accused, and bearing in mind your professional qualifications, now, would you say no, no, I that... I think my learned friend is trying to persuade us that this is an expert testimony. I merely wanted to remind the jury that the witness is a trained sociologist. Yes, and you'd also want to remind them that sociology is an inexact science, and the accused was her husband. Oh, of course, my lord. Uh, Mrs. Holt, how would you describe Mr. Galway? as a person that hates corruption. Uh, yes, could you be more specific? A dreamer. Well, Frank's not dangerous. He has no desire to be. Well, I, I should know I lived with him for 15 years. Yes. Uh, could you please... Uh, 
Uh, yes, could you give the court an example of what you mean by not dangerous? Yes, well, take the guest house where he was staying. If he'd had any intention of committing these so-called crimes with which he's been charged, you've only got to look at that room. I mean, it was an open invitation for anyone, not only me, but anyone, to, to walk in and read the whole story of his life, past, present and future. Now, did he say anything to you on that occasion? Yes, I, I don't really like to repeat that sort of thing, but it is important My Lord, will, will your Lordship allow me to say something? No, not while the witness is being examined. Your counsel could always recall you, if you wish. But that's the point. I, I resent her attempt to present me yes, to the jury as some um, sort of harmless eccentric. I don't want their pity. No. And I, 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 I don't want her private life put in front of them. Especially that. Uh, Mr. Denham, I think perhaps you'd better take further instructions from your client. Uh, yes, my Lord. <laughs> Do you think you're going to need an adjournment, Mr. Adams? Uh, 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 no, yes, my lord. Uh, uh, Mrs. Holt, from your knowledge of your ex-husband, would you describe him as a person having any propensity towards political action of any kind? In one word? Yes. Mr. Galway is incapable of any of the kind of action that you all have in mind. He always was. Thank you. Mrs. Holt have described my learned friend's client as a dreamer. Let's see how much of a dreamer he is. Is that a question? Oh, no, not yet. How long is it, in fact, since you and your husband were actually living together? Uh, uh, six years. Yes. And how often have you seen each other in that time? Oh, every few months. Yes, so you can't be quite sure, really, what he was actually doing. On the contrary, I, I have every knowledge of what he was doing. What was that? Well, a variety of things. He was... Uh... did you know that he was on the dole? Well, he wasn't. He was on Social Security. Well, oh, we won't quibble over a word. Just let's say that your husband stayed out of work for rather a long time. Just as he stay out of work after this trial is over, win or lose. Yes, I can imagine. Now, Mr. Parsons, we've managed to keep personal feelings out of this so far. Now, let's keep it that way. My lord. Now, this uh, last meeting, Mrs. Holt, at the Raven Guest House, did you discuss with Mr. Galway who his employers were? No. Now, I wonder why not. Because I didn't ask him. Why not? Well, since you're wondering, because I wanted to feel that he was standing on his own two feet for once. You still seem to retain a certain amount of affection for the accused, Mrs. Holt. Is that another question? If you wish. I do, yes. Yes. I think it's affecting your testimony. Well, you may think so, but I assure you that it isn't. I mean, you never seriously believed the story of being contracted to do research work, did you? Frank believed he was. Yes, that's the question, isn't it? I mean, according to you, he said, every country had to set its house in order before starting on others. Yes. I mean, did it surprise you to learn that he was responsible for one of our senior police officers going to a conference in Milan organized by fascists? That's really rather a stupid question. Well, perhaps it is. Will you answer it? No, it doesn't surprise me, because it doesn't alter the fact that personally he's harmless. Well, for a harmless man, Mr. Corway had rather a lot of money at his disposal quite suddenly. Well, if I were you, I would concentrate more on the people who put it at his disposal. He and Inspector Fleming are not big fish. Yes. Well, I think you may be underestimating your husband, Mrs. Holt. Thank you. Uh, you may leave the witness box. I call Stephen Marcus Rabinowitz. Stephen Marcus Rabinowitz. What is your religion? Protestant. Will you take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on the card? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please tell the court your name and address. In England? Uh, if you please. Stephen Rabinowitz, 27 River Edge Gardens, London SW6. And you are a member of the Institute for Democratic Solidarity? I'm its organizing secretary in this country. Now, could you tell us, in a word, what your organization represents? In a word, it represents anyone who feels the need for moral leadership in our age. You're acquainted with my client, I believe. 
Yes. Now, will you tell this court the circumstances under which you became acquainted? Certainly. Uh, one of our members met him at a series of lectures in 1975 and recommended him to me. As what? A sensitive person with experience. Yes, apart from that, how did he strike you? Depressed. He just spent some time with a divine light mission, unsuccessfully to judge by his state. Anyway, we both agreed that uh, idealism was useless unless you can channel it. What result did your conversation have? Mr. Galway was invited to undertake the odd piece of freelance research. Uh, my information is that he wrote two books for a publishing house connected with you, known as Free Franchise Features. I believe so. And following that, there was another contract, I understand. Now, um, what did this consist of? Uh, it was verbal. Yes, I understand that. Uh, but what were its contents? They were of a sensitive nature. Yes, I'm sure. Just as you have described my client, whose arrest they directly affected. Pardon me. It's, it's not that I'm thinking of right now. It's just that it wouldn't be in the public's interest to discuss them. Some people might get the wrong idea about our motives, and that wouldn't help our, your client. With the greatest respect, that is my concern. Mr. Rabinowitz, you seem to believe that you enjoy some special privilege in this court. I'll leave that to Your Honor's good judgment. The only public interest which operates here is that of the law. You see, if you continue to refuse to answer counsel's questions, I can, if I wish, rule you a hostile witness. I really don't think that'll be necessary. So, what does that mean? It means she'll be able to cross-examine you, to ask you leading questions. I'll answer it. Hmm? Oh, and you call me my lord. I'm sorry. That's all right. Miss Dillon? Now, what were the contents of your contract? Mr. Galway was invited to research the breakdown of democracy in this country. I told you you wouldn't find it pleasant listening. In what area? The forces, starting with the police. Oh, excuse me, I should have said the possibilities of a breakdown of democracy. Now, this next question is rather important. How was Mr. Galway to go about this research? Uh, he was given a free hand. Results were what counted. Yeah, how free? Completely. When you give a man a job, you trust him, don't you? Now, did that free hand include offering the police financial aid? Certainly not. He was authorized to suggest the possibility of our sponsoring various seminars on law and order, that kind of thing, if they felt there was some value in collaborating. Now, would it have included, as the uh, prosecution have alleged, his promising Chief Constable Vaughan your support in the event of a police strike? Uh, my lord, aren't I right in uh, thinking that they're forbidden by law to strike? You are quite correct. Well, there's your answer, negative. Now, could the free hand have included Mr. Galway requesting access to secret Home Office directives, as uh, Chief Constable Vaughan claims he did later in the course of that same dinner? Certainly not. Might it conceivably have included his offering to supply Mr. Vaughan with forged evidence, for the purpose of falsely prosecuting a left-wing organization. Is that a serious question? Oh, perfectly serious. The answer is no. Thank you. Now, may we now turn to the allegations arising from Inspector Fleming's visit to a conference in Milan on um, November the 9th of last year. Now, as far as your organization is concerned, was there any intention that he should, without his knowledge, be uh, represented at that conference as an official spokesman of the British police? None that I'm aware of. As I understand it, the gentleman wasn't even in uniform. Exactly, Mr. Rowinowitz. Now, if someone were to tell you that my client's activities on behalf of your organization were politically subversive, uh, what would you answer? Uh, I'd point out to them that politically your client's uh, a lightweight. You sh must have heard him give testimony, evidence. But as a researcher, he's pure gold. If it hadn't been for this case, he might have had a future with us. Thank you. Oh, please stay there. Mr. Rabinowitz, what does the Institute for Democratic Solidarity support in concrete terms? Could you give me an example? Well, I'd like you to give me one. In what field? In any field. Well, take industry. 
Our organization supports the right of the individual not to strike if he or she so chooses. Yes. So what about the police? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, I mean, where does that leave them? Ah, I'm glad you asked me that. You see, they're in a unique position. I mean, when a country loses respect for its armed forces, that's the beginning of moral breakdown. Yes. You think the police deserve more sympathy? Yes, but I don't want to tell you how to run your own affairs. No, I'm sure. Now, what made you think that Mr. Galway was the right person to research uh, police problems? Nothing specific. I mean, to your knowledge, had he ever worked in this field before? Not to my knowledge. No. Now, these two books he wrote for you, uh, for your publishing subsidiary, Free Franchise Features, do you know how many copies of, of those were sold? None. None? They were always intended to be distributed privately, free of charge. I'd say you have publications and public relations a little mixed up. And while we're on the subject, I'd like to correct the impression that Free Franchise Features is a subsidiary of ours. They're totally independent. Ah, I believe they're no longer in existence. Uh, yes, they have terminated, I believe. Yes. Do you know when that was? Uh, around February. Yes, around the same time as Mr. Galway's arrest, in fact. Yes. I see. And at approximately the same time, Detective Inspector Brannigan visited your offices in London with a member of the special branch, uh, where a secretary, um, I believe you happened not to be there at that precise moment, a secretary uh, told them that they knew of no Mr. Galway. Well, you know how secretaries get to be. And besides, he was never employed by us, just on a freelance contract. Yes. I suppose, actually, that... Uh, Detective Inspector Brannigan was quite lucky to find your offices at all, considering that neither their address nor telephone number are listed. Uh, sir, I came here voluntarily. Are you suggesting there's something to hide? Well, isn't there? I mean, wasn't the inspector's visit the real reason for the sudden termination of Mr. Galway's contract? You want to know the real reason? Because Frank went over on expenses, and not just once, and always on entertainment. He even tried to hit me for a loan till this thing was over. That's the real reason. Mr. Rubinovitz, from where does your organization receive its funds? Is this important, Mr. Parsons? Well, um, I think the witness's silence is sufficient answer, my lord. May I make a statement? If you wish. If a member of the special branch came to my office, why isn't he here today? This whole thing's been turned into a witch hunt by someone. I hope you're joking. I have a very strong sense of humor. Well, I advise you not to exercise it again in this court. Is that your statement? No. I wanted to say that if Mr. Galway committed any crime, my organization knew nothing about it. Very well. I'm sure the jury will take note of what you've said. Right. My lord. Now, Mr. Rabinowitz, uh, you're acquainted with what happened to Inspector Fleming in Milan, I think? Yes. You're aware that uh, he was invited by the defendant to attend a law and order conference there run by the fascist party. I want to be sincere with you. I happen to know that it wasn't. Well, you see, um, according to Inspector Fleming... Forget Inspector Fleming. It was organized by us. You just don't advertise that in a country like Italy if you're smart. Uh, so you practice subterfuge? I don't believe that the promotion of understanding on the international as well as the domestic plane should be described as subterfuge. Oh, quite. How much did uh, Mr. Galway get for this uh, Italian jaunt? I told you, he was on expenses only. My lord, may I produce as evidence an item from a Milan newspaper of November 10th which shows Inspector Fleming in the company of a leading uh, senator in the Italian parliament? You may not. It would be hearsay. In that case, may I quote a statistic? Uh, if you wish. Because of the crime rate, every fifth household in Italy now keeps a gun. That's why Inspector Fleming was invited. Well, um, is that supposed to have something to do with the breakdown of democracy in this country? You really don't care, do you? Oh, yes. We just don't happen to elect fascists to our parliament. The war's been over a long time, my friend. Mm. My lord, that concludes the case for the defense. There has been an attempt by my colleague to present him to you as some sort of mad hatter. Well, that would be a very pleasant joke. But for the fact that the events that Mr. Galway have been involved in are no tea party. 
Now, you may ask yourselves, what harm has Mr. Galway really done? You may say, does it really matter that two police officers were offered perks, not to kill anyone, but just to bend the rules a little in what some people may even see as a good cause? Well, these two police officers are the grassroots of our democracy, and if they are not, uh, then neither you nor I are. And I would remind you that the career of one of them has been permanently damaged with uh, coming into contact uh, with Mr. Galway. So Francis Galway is not harmless in effect. Uh, was he perhaps in intention? Uh, was he, to use another image, uh, just a sheep among wolves? Well, I put it to you, we can only judge a man uh, by the company he keeps. Merely speculation. And if the speculations of my learned friend were correct, then I would have no doubt that my client is guilty. Unfortunately for him, there is no way of telling whether they are, for the simple reason which uh, even he should understand, is that there is no concrete evidence to support them. Now, we know that Chief Constable Vaughan enjoyed a pleasant dinner at the defendant's expense, and we know that Inspector Fleming went to a conference in Milan with him. Beyond that, nothing. Now, you're being asked to believe that these men were bought. I suggest they came willingly. And if there was any misunderstanding, it was partly due to my client's personality, which you have had a chance to observe, but much more a certain rigid, even suspicious way of thinking, which is all too common in the police mind and understandable, which is why I am not trying to throw stones, merely to deflect those unfair stones which are being cast towards Mr. Galway. Members of the jury, this has been in some ways a difficult case to listen to. In many trials, a jury is called upon to decide whether a series of facts did or did not take place. In this one, the facts themselves are relatively clear-cut and you're being asked to decide what interpretation should be placed on those facts. That is a far harder task. Now the law itself clearly states, under section 53 of the Police Act, any person who does any act calculated to cause disaffection among the members of any police force shall be guilty of an offence. Now you'll notice the phrase cal calculated to cause disaffection is used. I want you to remember that because it's the nub of the matter. Now let us turn first to the conversation between the Chief Constable and Mr. Galway on January the 4th. Now, if you believe the Chief Constable, Mr. Galway made a series of suggestions which if acted upon would have been in clear breach of the law. He even produced this document we all had a chance to see and judge. Was it, as has been alleged, intended to induce a false prosecution against the workers' activist group? Or do you believe Mr. Galway when he says it was simply a study paper meant for discussion? Indeed, the discussion was all that took place that night. Anything else is a product of the witness's imagination, aided by two bottles of wine and some brandy. And the same question arises out of Inspector Fleming's visit to Milan on November the 8th. Did the defendant deliberately trick him into going there and speaking at this meeting? Or did he think he had genuinely sought the permission of his superior officers? Now, if you feel convinced beyond reasonable doubt that what Mr. Galway said or did, even on just one occasion, was calculated to cause disaffection, then you will convict him. But you will, I know, consider carefully his claim to have been engaged on research and if it seems to you that that may have been his motive, then you will acquit him. Remember, it is for the prosecution to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. Now, will you please retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict. Members of the jury, will your foreman please rise? Just answer the question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict on which you are all agreed? Yes. On the charge before you, how do you find the accused? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Mr. Galway, whatever your motives, your activities have brought you closer to the law 
than any intelligent man should dare. You are free to go. The court will rise.